Okay, so CDD, Communicable Disease Division at the Ministry of Health, we are responsible for uh, coming up with national policies for the control of uh, communicable diseases of public health importance. Uh, we also have to work with other agencies which have uh, different uh, areas of responsibility. For example, the National Environment Agency is in charge of the environment, including vector control, public hygiene, licensing of food establishments. The ABA, the Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority, they are in charge of uh, making sure that uh, food that is brought into Singapore is safe. Uh, for for you know use for for for, for consumption for food, uh, and so for example, when there is a food outbreak uh, uh, that we needs to be investigated, we actually do a joint investigation with NEA and ABA. Okay, then there are also programs that are funded by the ministry, by and CDD is like the death hit for this uh, for these programs. So for example, a nas the national TB program is uh, fund fully funded by the ministry and is uh, carried out by the TBCU on behalf of the ministry. The DSC carries out the national STI control program. So that's where you know how this, all these agencies sort of fit together. Now the CDC historically has been like the national uh, center for isolation of patients. You know, in, the, in, the, in the old days, you know, they used to isolate patients with cholera, for example, or typhoid. You know. And, and, and that, so the ministry funds uh, part of the CDC operations, so that has continued until today. Well, one factor that, was, uh, that helped was our relatively smaller size compared to our neighbours and our rapid development. Okay, so with that, with that uh, came, it made it easier for comprehensive uh, environmental control measures uh, for the control of the Anopheles vector for malaria eradication, you know, and you know, outbreaks of uh, malaria were quickly detected and you know contained. So together, you know, it was no surprise that you know by the early 1980s we, we managed to eradicate malaria. But many of our neighbors are so well on their way to eradicate malaria. So it's a matter of time that they will also reach that eradication stage. You know, typhoid, foodborne diseases, uh, very much. Because you know, from the early 1970s, when the Ministry of Environment was formed, you know, there was a great emphasis on making sure that uh, proper hygiene standards were practiced by the food uh, vendors, you know, and they were properly organized and policed. And then, uh, safe water, modern sanitation, you know, played you know, a great role in in, in uh, making sure that uh, these diseases like cholera and typhoid were you know were were eradicated from Singapore. So for SARS, you know, we, we use established public health methods to uh, detect cases early, isolate them, carry out contact tracing, trace their, their contacts uh, as comprehensively as we could, uh, quarantine those contacts, you know, so basically try to break the chain of transmission. And uh, it was quite challenging because in the in the first month or so, there was no diagnostic test, so we had to rely on uh, symptom uh, the presenting symptoms plus a history of you know contact and and as but we erred on the side of safety, so if we really suspect someone as being a case, we would just isolate him first and not take chances, and uh, eventually you know this all these measures help to contain SARS. I think I must especially mention the healthcare workers. You know, uh, they had to manage, you know, uh, SARS patients. And in the early days, before uh, people knew about SARS, many of them got got infected themselves. But once uh, infection control uh, measures were put in place, uh, there were no further transmissions. But still, I think it was quite challenging for these healthcare workers to. Day in, day out, with all this PPE, you know, with all the precautions, temperature monitoring, uh, manage the patients, and I think it was everyone's effort that together contained SARS. Now, because of our SARS experience, you know, we the uh, sort of containment strategy featured very strongly in our pandemic planning. 
So our flu pandemic plans also contain a phase where we would try to contain uh, even a flu pandemic, although we know that actually you know, it's quite difficult to contain influenza. So in H1N1, uh, that's what we did. So when it first came, the first cases came, we basically went all out to try to contain them. And our thinking was that we wanted to slow down the, the spread of H1N1. And to a certain extent, we succeeded at the beginning. But of course, you know, eventually, we, we, that gave way to a mitigation strategy. So our pre uh, preparation is all on three fronts. First, prevention. So we want to be sure that uh, people who travel to areas where there's transmission of mers cov for example, uh, know what precautions they should take. For example, you know, they should stay away from camels. So that, that uh, we put out to, to pilgrims who go there and also to business travellers. You know. so, uh, and when they come back, they are all given health advisories. And this includes people who are coming for, as tourists to Singapore from the Middle East. They are given health advisories uh, to know what the symptoms are of MERS and you know, what they should do if they fall sick within the first two weeks, the incubation period of, the, of MERS. Um, then we want to be sure that if there is a case, we are able to detect that case as early as possible. So we have put a, the first layer of defense at the airport in terms of screening for uh, incoming travelers from uh, affected areas for fever, but of course we know that there are lots of limitations with that, you know, that strategy. So we have also made, ensured that doctors in clinics, in, in emergency departments, they are well aware of, um, of MERS and they are on the lookout for possible cases. And indeed, you know, we have many cases that uh, the doctors have uh, admitted for testing and thankfully all have been negative. Next, uh, is uh, making sure that if we do have a case, that we are able to contain it well. You know, uh, try to prevent, is, if there is an outbreak, you know, we want to minimize that, that outbreak as, um, as much as we can. And so lessons that we learn from SARS or that will come into play. So in terms of a containment strategy, you know, South, anything that what, what we saw in South Korea, I, I believe can happen anywhere. You know, whether it's a developed country like Singapore or a developing country, I think it can happen anywhere. So we have to be prepared. Yeah, so, you know, dengue is, uh, is the, the vector for dengue, Aedes aegypti, is very much an urban, very well adapted to urban environments. And if you con look at Singapore's dense urban landscape, actually it's hugely challenging to control dengue. Uh, but I think, so, to, in, in, in that perspective, I think the, the NEA yeah, has done uh, a good job, you know, uh, sort of, if despite the, the outbreaks that happen every few years, um, I think they have managed to, to sort of minimize the impact of dengue. You know, so, you know, for example, you don't, you, you don't have so many uh, outbreaks that is out of control and many deaths, you know, from dengue. Um, Chikungunya, for chikungunya, it's a different vector, Albopictus, who thrives in you know the forested areas and the you know where there's dense greenery. So it's even more challenging to control. And the fact that uh, we have managed to uh, prevent chikungunya from being entrenched, becoming sort of very endemic in Singapore, I think is is testament to our, our the efforts of NEA that uh, in terms of controlling the mosquitoes uh, that, that transmit the disease. As to what else could be done, you know, I think um, NEA should uh, perhaps look into how they can intensify their vector surveillance uh, methods and uh, preempt um, outbreaks from happening by sort of, you know, intensifying vector control measures whenever their vector surveillance show an uptick in the vector population. So that's one way that I think that we can strengthen our control of these vector-borne diseases. NEA should also uh, implement new, new methods of uh, vector control such as Wolbachia infected uh, mosquitoes. You know. And of course, we all look forward to the dengue vaccine that uh, may be licensed by the end of next year. Uh, although there is a limited 
efficacy for for example against them too but I, I think it has a place to add to our our you know total uh, defense against dengue so uh, we look forward to all these new methods of dengue control I believe that we will continue to face new emerging infectious diseases you know so after MERS there will be something else you know in fact MERS today is the greatest threat for the whole world and for Singapore uh, so we, we hope that you know if we do have a case of MERS that we will respond very well uh, but like I said you know we will continue to encounter new emerging infectious diseases what should we do to prepare I think we should continue to invest in our people make sure that we are very well resourced at all levels you know from in public health from surveillance to uh, people who conduct outbreak investigations contact tracing that we have proper systems in place to quarantine people in the hospitals make sure that we have people who are uh, you know can manage the patients well clinically safely and also conduct good research on on cases as they occur in, in singapore i think um my wish for singapore is that you know we we, we continue to build up our resources our our knowledge about uh, the how we have you know how we control how we should control uh, the various infectious diseases that come our way and my wish is also that we uh, share in a, in, a, in a bigger way with the rest of the world you know uh, about how we have uh, done so about our experiences in combating com uh, communicable diseases i think um, perhaps there are some useful lessons that we could share with the rest of the world